Please welcome Elliot Higgins, founder and creative director of Bellingcat. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Elliot Higgins. I'm the, as he says, founder and creative director of Bellingcat. Um, I founded Bellingcat eight years ago in 2014. Um, we specialize in open source investigations, so that's using publicly available information to investigate a variety of incidents, often with conflict zones. Now, eight years ago when I started Bellingcat, I did a lot of events like this, and I would go on stage, I'd present my work, and everyone would look at it, and they'd clap, and it was like being a magician on stage. I was pulling rabbits out of hats. And I didn't want that. I wanted everyone to do this stuff, because to me, it seems quite straightforward, not that difficult to do, but there were so few people doing it, certainly not professional organizations. It was just me and a bunch of bloggers, really. But over the years, we've trained several thousand people. We've shared information on our website to show people how to do this kind of work. And with the conflict in Ukraine, I really think open source investigation has really come of age. Um, so in this presentation, I will take you through some of the examples of that. So prior to the invasion of Ukraine, we had lots of videos like this being shared on social media from Russia, um, in particular on TikTok. And what this showed were numerous Russian troop movements. Um, and for us, this was really useful because there were these claims from the Russians that these troop movements were just normal training exercises, when, in fact, by looking at these videos, we could see vehicles, equipments, and units that usually weren't part of training exercises. And looking at the contents of these videos, for example, the buildings visible, we were able to geolocate these videos and start mapping them out and understand where these military units were. And this is one example from the uh, Center for Information Resilience of a mapping effort they've been doing. They've been doing this for the entire conflict, but this shows the videos from the first days prior to the conflict showing these troop movements. And what's actually being generated is a huge amount of information that can be very useful for understanding conflict and the buildup of conflict. You can actually go to this map yourself. You can click on these various dots. It will show you the original post. There will be discussions about how it was geolocated. And that allows us to understand this conflict in a way that we really couldn't. But this was just the beginning. We also had the usual disinformation that was being produced from Russian and pro-Russian sources. So this video I'm about to show you was shared by the Donetsk People's Republic, one of the separatist republics in eastern Ukraine. Now, you can't really see much in this video. They're shooting at leaves, apparently. Um, and there's really not much detail. You know, this seems like a guy's rolling about shooting a gun. But the context of this video was quite significant in the kind of propaganda and disinformation campaigns. And you've just heard an explosion that's quite important to this story. Because when this was shared on the Telegram channel of the Donetsk People's Republic on February 18th, 2022, it came through with a number of claims. The most significant one is that a group of saboteurs were planning to, planning to blow up a, a container of chlorine near a sewage treatment plant. And this fed into a kind of disinformation theme at that time that the um, Ukrainian government were trying to trigger a chemical incident. They also made some other slightly bizarre claims, like they were claiming that the saboteurs were communicating in Polish for some reason. That actually fed into like another theme of disinformation, that there were foreign countries involved, including Poland, in attacks on separatist-held territory. The problem is, they made a mistake with this video. Most social media platforms, when you share a video or a photograph, it strips the original metadata. Telegram isn't like that. Telegram leaves all the metadata in. And this is just some of the metadata that was left in that file that they shared on Telegram, the video of this supposed sabotage. And this was really a blueprint to how they faked this video, and it gave us the evidence we need to show that this was untrue. Now, when I'm saying we, I'm talking not just Bellingcat, but a whole community of people on the internet, some of them involved in geolocating those videos, other people who are longtime open source investigators, people who are just interested in the conflict, figuring this stuff out using publicly available tools, which is really a core of what we're trying to show people at Bellingcat, that anyone can look at this stuff. And there were various interesting things found in this video. For example, the creation date of the original file was 10 days before the event supposedly took place, which in itself was very odd. There was other information, for example, there was the project file path that was included in the metadata also 10 days before the incident took place. It showed us that it had been edited in Adobe, hence all these strange file names like Pantry History Software Agent, which I spent a lot of time on Google examining. And one very interesting line. So, and keep in mind, this was just a group of people on the internet picking this thing apart in the minutes and hours after it was shared online. 
This is a very specific description. So this is one of the ingredient files. That is something that was added to the file that was created and the file name of it, which is M72A5Law and APALS Live Fire. That's a very strange title, but straight away people recognize this because if you ever use an app that downloads videos from YouTube, it always uses the file name uh, as the file name, the YouTube title. So you just copy and paste that text and you paste it into YouTube and you find this video. This is from a Finnish military exercise from uh, 2010, I believe, yes. Now, why was this audio and this footage in there? Well, what they'd actually done, and this was discovered by people examining the waveform of this video and the other video, they'd taken explosions from this firing range video of the Finnish army and copy and pasted them into the fake video because they didn't have enough explosions in the videos. And all of this was exposed in a kind of group community effort around this incident. And what happened was this didn't really reach the kind of disinformation ecosystem because it was kind of almost pre-bunked. It was debunked so quickly by a community who was engaged with open source investigation that it didn't really have the impact they wanted. It didn't even get to the point where the kind of conspiracy community started believing it because once it gets in there, it's very difficult to convince them otherwise. So it's this almost kind of preventative effect. Now, this is one thing this kind of community came together to do online. Another was um, geolocating videos. One thing that we learned very early on um, with this conflict is that there needed to be these videos collected and preserved. One um, really kind of big thing we learned from studying the conflict in Syria is it's really easy to assume all these videos and photographs are going to be Twitter and YouTube forever and ever, but that's completely untrue. We need to make them archived, we need to make them searchable. So people online started realizing this was a useful, useful thing to do, and it, it kind of added to the community understanding of the conflict and what was going on. But we wanted to take that a step further and actually turn it into a useful data set. So we started a project at Bellingcat where we started collecting those kind of claims. And this is just part of the process where we'd have a source from the social media channels that would then go into a kind of triage unit to decide is it relevant to what we're trying to look at, and we're particularly interested in civilian harm incidents. Then that went into what we call our Civ harm sheet. It's just a spreadsheet, it's not fancy. Um, but then it goes into our um, global authentication project for geolocation. Now that's a group of volunteers that we've trained in geolocation. We've given them tra trauma training as well because they can be dealing with quite tough imagery. They geolocate it themselves. We then have our staff members double check it. And then that goes back into the sheet and that goes into our civilian harm time map. This is available at ukraine.bellingcat.com. We've been doing it for the entire conflict. It now has um, over, I think, seven or 800 incidents logged into that. And each of these dots is a social media post with a photograph or video that's been geolocated. You can actually go in and download the data yourself if you want to use it. There's a more complete version of this data set that we're providing now to a range of um, international bodies, NGOs, accountability organizations. In a way, we've become a kind of service provider verifying this content and providing that to them as quickly as possible, in a way taking that work off them and doing it ourselves. You can filter it you know, by type of incident, where it happened, what kind of munition was visible. So what we're trying to do is take this information and turn it into useful data for accountability purposes and other uh, activity. We also learned through our work with um, Syria that there has to be a process for analyzing this kind of content, which is legally sound. We do a lot of work that is considered journalism, but Balincat is really about investigation, and then, in a way, journalism is one of the things that comes out of that. But we've also been increasingly involved with legal accountability, working with legal um, bodies nationally and internationally, and providing evidence. Over the last four years, we've been running something called the Yemen Project, which has been um, with the Global Legal Action Network, using uh, a process that is specifically designed for archiving and investigation, that is designed to create packages that are then shareable with accountability processes. We've actually just released two papers on um, the application of open source investigation with the Global Legal Action Network. And that really expands on the process that we already have. So the first part of the process is here. We then continue that into the more in-depth investigation process that is intended for accountability. We preserve the evidence that we're collecting on the civilian harm sh sheet with an organization called Mnemonic Labs, who created something originally called the Syrian Archive. They wanted to archive as much material from Syria as possible, and they ended up with millions and millions of videos and photographs from that conflict and started expanding that into other ones, including Ukraine. We um, preserve that, but then we 
triage again, deciding which are the most likely investigations that for, you know, valuable to prosecutors or, or the most interesting. And then we start this whole process. I won't describe the process here because it's long, complicated, and probably quite boring for you. Uh, we then put that into an evidentiary database called the WASI, which is then made available to any organization that we're working with on legal accountability. So what we're really trying to do is take our work beyond just journalism and reporting and fact-checking to something where there can be real accountability. Because we're dealing with people, with the Russian Federation, who don't really care about accountability. They don't care about moral accountability and they don't care about legal accountability. Partly because we're not very good at doing the legal accountability part of it. And just to give you a sense of how crass the Russian Federation can be with its disinformation, I want to use a few examples. So, for example, you probably recognize this photograph. It was from a hospital bombing in the early days of the conflict. There were two photographs, one of this woman um, and a second woman who was taken from the building and sadly died of her injuries later. Now, this incident generated a lot of disinformation and propaganda. You had kind of social media accounts from like Pandemic Truth, for example, and other accounts making claims saying, oh, it's the same woman, she's an actress, so on and so forth. Now, this isn't just something that goes around the more conspiratorial areas of the internet. It's a message that's amplified by the Russian Federation itself. This is the Russian embassy in the UK making claims that, you know, she's actually the same woman in both photographs. Completely untrue. But I want to play you this clip now from Dutch television. It's in English, don't worry. Uh, from Dutch television with the Russian ambassador to the um, Netherlands talking to a journalist about this incident and the evidence that he presents to support his claim. Let me just uh, illustrate uh, what I said about the disinformation boom. We saw this picture of uh, pregnant women, uh, maternity ward in Mariupol. These are all actors. On front pages, uh, New York Times and uh, other media. Well, actually, this is only one woman. She is featured here, rushing down the stairwell. Here she changed clothes and uh, she has been brought on this stretcher. But you're showing this to me, but if you have any real evidence yes, that this is not real as been stated, why did you show it to me? The, I'm just a journalist in the is, Netherlands. Why don't you show it to the no, United but, Nations? Uh, yes, it, it has been shown. It has been shown. And do they believe you? This From is, what I know, they warn you uh, that if you continue, a lady this blogger, is a constitutional and, war crime. Uh, I leave you these uh, uh, materials and you will see many, many comments uh, uh, and the and, comments uh, make it uh, true. The list of them is a bloody comedian. How much did you get paid? So this is evidence he says has been presented to the UN. And his evidence of the comments on an Instagram post that she made from random social media users who obviously have been fueled by the conspiracies that they're seeing online. This is the quality of Russia's evidence when it comes to attacking claims that it's been bombing hospitals in Ukraine. But one thing that's really changed with this conflict is kind of before, Russia's bombing hospitals all the time in Syria, and very rarely was there any news coverage of it, and usually it was months later, because no, no major media organization really took the time, at the, time, the time to investigate it. But with this, we had CNN and other major news organizations looking into this. And this is actually a really major change. The use of open source investigation in this way by major media organizations is being done on a level and a scale that we've really not seen before. This combined with the efforts of the accountability community to use open source investigation from the first days of the conflict really is a huge change. Now, this wasn't obviously the only incident that Russia push disinformation on. So again, in Bruka, we remember the footage of the first um, Ukrainian convoys entering the town, the corpses on the floor. I will have to say there are some slightly graphic images in here. And again, you had random Twitter users with dodgy handles making claims that this was fake. One of the popular claims was that one of the bodies actually was moving, that they moved their hands as the convoy drove by. And again, we have the Russian embassies pushing this same message. Um, the thing is, this doesn't, isn't actually what they think it is. If you watch this video now of the convoy, which shows the body in question, you'll actually see what it is, is a raindrop on the windscreen just moving across the body. And they're claiming that this is actually the body moving its hand. And this is, again, disinformation that's being pushed by the Russian Federation. Again, though, we have the work of the US media and others analyzing this footage, using satellite imagery to show that the bodies were there the day before. 
In fact, only yesterday, the Russian foreign ministry put out a nine-minute video that included claims from a, a French activist, as he called himself, he was really a fantasist, um, claiming that he arrived there first and he watched the Azov battalion places the bodies whilst journalists were waiting. But this work from the New York Times demonstrated how um, they were actually able to use satellite imagery with the drive through and show how various bodies were in position on the satellite imagery prior to the actual, um, before the Azov battalion and all these other units were arriving. So you can see very clearly here, you can see on the satellite imagery where there's a body, they can mark it off and say it was already here. So these claims from Russia that the bodies were placed, that they're even pushing you know, in the last 24 hours, are completely false. And again, we can respond to this very, very quickly now because there's a whole community of people, professionals, semi-professionals, amateurs, weird people on the internet doing this stuff all the time. Something else that's been really useful as well is the availability of satellite information. This is footage from an attack on a Russian airbase. It was in Crimea. Um, there was a footage filmed from the beach. This was all geolocated. And even before Russia could come up with an answer to what really happened, thanks to Planet Labs, we were able to get satellite imagery for the following day that showed what this location looked like. So this was the area that we believed had been hit in this airstrike using geolocation to find the exact location. And this is what it looked like the following day. The structures destroyed, aircraft destroyed, and this really wasn't possible even you know, two or three years ago. What we have now with Ukraine is satellite imagery to this quality available very, very rapidly. So when you have these claims of you know, bakery and lies coming from the Russian government, we can respond much more quick, quickly, both in traditional media organizations, both as an online community. The problem is Russia really doesn't care about this. They will just dismiss it, as I've just demonstrated with Booker. They'll just repeat the same lies time and time again. So you can kind of work on the legal accountability side of it. This is something that we're doing at Ballincat, and it's very important work. There's a whole community who are very heavily engaged with this. Um, what we also have, though, is a very different kind of community, um, a community called NAFO, which is basically an ad hoc online trolling, kind of tra trash posting community, who um, is made up of a whole range of different people. Some of them are the kind of informal open source people who kind of have followed my work and the work of other people for a long time. And I'm just really frustrated that no matter how good your analysis, no matter how seriously you take it, Russia will keep lying and lying. So they go the other way. They just fill the internet with complete trashy, insulting responses to what the Russian officials are putting out. And it's really effective. It really makes it difficult for Russian officials to put their messages out online or any kind of official source to do that because as soon as it's out there, all the replies are just filled up with sarcastic, insulting, low-quality posts that just mocks them. And they react really badly to it. There's so many kind of, of these um, you know, pro-Russian experts who really believe that this is a NATO disinformation campaign and are absolutely furious because of it. And really, it's just a bunch of people on the internet mucking about. But it's actually a really effective counter disinformation tactic. What's also happened is it's actually really formed a community. Um, often with the conflicts you know, that goes on for a long time, people lose interest. But by having this kind of more humorous approach, it's keep, kept people engaged. You've now got St. Javelin, which is a, a merchandise website that sells clothing with the branding. And that clothing is sold um, so they can raise money for charity to give it to basically Ukraine for various projects. Some of it is. Uh, kind of more military focus than others, but so far they've raised over a million dollars selling merchandise based off basically a lot of people trash posting on the internet. Um, so for the future, what we're trying to at Ballincat is we're continuing to focus on our accountability efforts, and we really want to expand what we're doing here, collecting this digital evidence, making it available for accountability, because there's lots of organizations doing this kind of work, and they're doing it kind of all in slightly different ways. But the problem for the likes of the International Criminal Court, for example, and this is something that came up a lot in Syria, is we have so many different organizations with archives of digital evidence. Actually, getting to it's really difficult because you've got to know who they are, who's the right person to email. You've got to ask the right questions and describe the incident you're looking for in the right way. Um, so what we're working on now is developing a system that allows multiple archives to be indexed centrally, allowing the archive holders to have full control of their data, but also make that index searchable by actors like the International Criminal Court and other accountability bodies. So this kind of data can be searchable with a few mouse clicks. 
And my hope is that will really make a difference in our understanding of conflicts and reaching accountability for what's happening in places like Ukraine and in other conflict zones in the future. So that's Bellingcat, and thank you very much.